It's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Kerry Smith. His initials behind his name, CPHRM, stands for Certified Professional Healthcare Risk Management. And that's a certification from the American Hospital Association. And then followed by CIC, Certified Insurance Counselor. Kerry is a Certified Professional in Healthcare Risk Management for the American Hospital Association and the American Society for Healthcare Risk Management. And a Certified Insurance Counselor from the National Alliance. Through his experience working with dentists, about 95% of his business is all in dentistry, um, Kerry founded Dundesk, dentistry's first online platform designed to help the dental entrepreneur manage risk. In addition to his role at Dundesk, Kerry has provided training programs for dental schools, um, ASDA, private practices, dental groups, Texas Dental Association, American Association of Dental Office Managers, and the Seattle Study Club. His professional background includes 15 years of risk management ex experience in dentistry and 11 years of corporate HR leadership at Motorola, Cigna Healthcare, the Hartford Insurance Company. Kerry is also the founder of Dentist Secure, Dentist Secure Labs, and High Trust Practice. My gosh, we got so many things to talk about. For, first of all, let's start at the beginning. Yeah. How did you end up in dentistry? Well, uh, partly because my brother's an oral surgeon in austin really? yeah so I going did not know that how did i miss that uh, uh well what, i didn't tell you uh, mark smith mark smith now yep. see in in uh when i went to college if you walked in a uh, liquor store and said your name was mark smith uh they wouldn't believe you uh <laughs> so mark smith uh he's an uh, oral surgeon in uh austin texas yep sure is wow and uh so um was his um father or in dentistry or nope no nope. he's the first person in the family to go into dentistry yep uh not the first entrepreneur though that's uh, my family's full of entrepreneurs and so that was within his uh his track you know just to go learn a technical skill and then go sell it so is he your older brother or younger, younger brother? brother by a year younger brother or also that is yep. so darn cool does he like it i think so he's been doing it a while <laughs> yeah so your brother mark becomes an oral surgeon and what did you do well uh it it he called me regarding some insurance related questions and I would happen to be in the insurance field at the time. And, um, we worked through a number of things and I said, you know, do you know what this all means? These insurance policies. And he goes, no, I'm spending about 15 grand a year on insurance. I don't know what any of this stuff means. And I said, how big of a problem is this for you? And how many of your friends think the same way? And we just started getting phone calls after that. And, uh, then, uh, uh Providence led me to start my own brokerage and that's where we just started going, talking to dentists. Okay, I want I got to start at the very beginning because yep. my uh, my homies uh, quarter of them are still in dental school, yep. and the rest are all under thirty. Um, and um, what was the your, your brother, an oral surgeon, was paying fifteen thousand dollars a year, which they think is a huge chunk of change. What what was he spending fifteen thousand a year on? They're, they're wondering what 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 would an oral surgeon spend. 15,000 year. What, what kind of risk are we talking about? Well, I mean, there's, there's different segments there. There was uh, his malpractice insurance policy, obviously for a surgeon, because it's more invasive. You're going to pay more insurance for that than a general dentist would. So there's a key differentiator there. Do, do you know those prices offhand? I don't, part? I don't recall Howard. Yeah. Well, the exact I, prices, I mean, yeah. for today, for today. So his business insurance, so covering his practice, probably in the neighborhood of $2,000 a year. And yeah. covering his practice, not for, um, oral surgery malpractice. No, sir. No, sir. This would just be for, for the business insurance liability, general liability there in the practice, your equipment, you know, if the place catches fire or if a car comes through the front door or what have you, um, that, and then uh, workers compensation that you need in most States, except for in Texas, it's not a required policy. Um, but God, the, I love Texas. They don't have zoning laws either. Well, the, the thing about the work comp that's, that's scary though, is people here, I don't have to buy work comp in Texas, but then the state holds you unlimitedly responsible for injuries to your employees and your health insurance doesn't cover workers comp related injuries or work related injuries. So you're in a, you end up in a pretty big hole there uh, financially. Which should really motivate you not to really injure your employees. Yeah. Yeah. So without create, a government agency. Yeah, well, yeah. Create a safer work environment would be what I would say as a, a risk management technique to avoid you from needing to use workers comp insurance. That's you know, when I, one of my jobs, I used to work at a Twico, which, um, uh, made copper handles for Coleman heaters uh -huh. yeah. <clears throat> and above every cutting machine, they had a glass jar with a severed finger or thumb. And it looked like that's <laughs> real. And it was so cool because every time I walked up to that machine, you, you thought it's kind of like a pilot's checklist. You thought, 
don't add your finger to that jar. But anyway, um, yep. so general liability, which is about 2000 here, just for general liability. Yeah, just, these, these kids I've never bought yep. insurance. So general liability is just for your, your office facility. Someone falls down, fire, all that stuff. Yep, yep. And then the other one was workers' comp. Workers' comp for work-related injuries. Um, workers' comp for yep. work-related injury, which is one of the um, four pillars of socialism. I know that's a cuss word and all that kind of stuff, but the four pillars of socialism go all the way back. Um, to Roosevelt, and he kept saying that the people had four major complaints, and the four major complaints were um, age-related um, um, retirement. So um, you worked the railroad until you, you couldn't work, and then you went and crawled under a tree and died. So the people wanted to um, have an age-related income, and that was the Social Security program. And then the other one was um, um, workers' comp, and um, so workers' comp and Social Security, they're not... Um, I mean, the, these are legal statutory laws. They're not, um, I mean, they're, they're, they're federal laws. And then the, um, what was the other one? Uh, workers' comp. Uh, one was health care. That's the one he um, never got. What was the, um, uh, oh, unemployment. I mean, the, the railroad workers, I know, um, I know you have strong feelings on this stuff, but the railroad workers, they would, um, when, when they connected to two railroads coming from San Fran, from the East Coast, when they connect them, it was in, um, Provo, not Provo, Utah, somewhere in Utah. With the golden spike. Yeah. When they were done, the row of people just left home and they left like 5,000 Chinese people in the middle of nowhere. And they were like, um, when you fire us, can we have just a little cash flow to get another job? So unemployment insurance is mandatory statutory. Workers' comps, mandatory statutory. Social Security is mandatory statutory. And now, a century later, 20 countries out of 220 have the, the health care. And it'll be an American debate for a long, long time. It's, um, but uh, so three of the four pillars of socialism have already been enacted in the United States. So, so you're talking about um, um, malpractice uh, for oral surgeon, general liability, workers' comp. What was the other one? Well, those are the three you really need to get into business uh, relative to your lease agreement contracts and maybe bank requirements. The rest of them that he was spending a lot of money on were relative to disability and life insurance. And in, in his particular case, he had a life insurance policy that was a whole life policy that was costing him around 8,000 bucks a year. And we looked at it and said, look, man, I mean, if you, why are you spending eight grand on something you could spend maybe $800 a year on for a term life policy, which is cheaper than a whole life. So he's like, I didn't know that. So we he canceled that policy. So, and said, so is it still the general thing? I mean, I got my MBA 20 years ago, but yep. the whole life was a joke back then. Is it still a joke and you just go to term? Or do you see whole life having to modify and get? Well, the, the, thing that, the thing I've seen with whole life is that there's this investment component to it that seems attractive, that you can borrow money against the value to expand your practice or whatever. Money's cheap right now. You don't need to borrow life insurance against your life insurance. So, so you don't see any reason for a whole life policy. Well, term. there is a there is a reason. If you if you die, you need it. Uh, your family. Oh, if needs you die, it. you yeah. need nothing. <laughs> well, you don't, but your family does. But the uh, uh, the whole life. I think there's better ways to handle either the money that you'd spend on a whole life policy and really try to understand the risk you're you're insuring. So, for example, like myself, I bought a 30 year term when I was 40 years old. So that gets me to 70 and that's by a factor cheaper than buying a whole life policy that would pay when I actually died. So I figured, you know, look, on my earning years, I'm done when I'm 70 earning years wise that if I died, that would have replaced those earnings earnings uh, or financial obligations. So there's um, as, as dental students and new dentists, whole, whole life policies as an investment vehicle and a potential borrowing source, it's no bueno. There's, there's better ways to do that. Okay, my homies know if you go to McDonald's, they sell a Big Mac frying a Coke. Mm -hmm. Your Big Mac frying a Coke is malpractice, general liability, workers' comp, disability, and life insurance policy. Is that because you have two websites? You have dentistsecure.com yep. and Dundesk. Yep. Um, so, do you want to talk about both of those websites or do you just want to focus on? Do you, well, let's start. Do you want to start with dentistsecure.com yep. or den, dundesk.com? Well, let's, uh, let's do both, but I'll start off with why. Why do those exist? And the nature of, of, we have this philosophy, I have it is that risk is infinite and the benefit you get out of dentistry is finite. And some people in, figure out ways to treat risk in singular ways. So insurance is one risk management technique. It's like as a dentist, 
you don't treat pathology with extraction only, right? There's Your other. Brother does. He's well, a well, he does, but oh my gosh, uh, <laughs> he pulls everything. <laughs> but there, but before it gets to that point. The general dentist doesn't say, well, you know, you have perio, so let's extract, right? There's, there's risk and there's different ways to treat that risk. And insurance, an insurance policy is one way to treat risk for a dentist. Oftentimes, a dentist is only presented that opportunity and they, don't, they know nothing else. And the reason why I started Dundesk and our other compliance training programs and even high trust practice was that, the, one, I wanted to provide more to dentists, more comprehensive way to manage risk and to offer different techniques. So you, we mentioned workers' comp. The best way to have high work comp bills is to injure your employees through bad work practices. The best way to have low workers' comp premiums is to not hurt people. And the way you do that is through training, education. So you would think as far as Sharps injuries go in a practice, the, the more frequent injury a person would face in a practice, dental practice relative to Sharps would be what? What would you imagine? The causality, the item that would cause the injury. What would you think that would be? Infection control, getting hepatitis or something. Well, the actual the actual implement that would cause the injury, a sharps injury in a dental practice. What do you think that would be? Threading a needle. Yeah, it could be could be a, a needle, right? Most people say a, um, a syringe or a needle, irrigation needle, whatever. It actually ends up being a burr. A so, burn. Burr. Burr oh, burr. Burrs, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, the docs aren't taking the burrs after the prep. They're not taking the burr out of the handpiece. And therefore, when someone comes in to clean because they're trying to turn it over in a hurry, they're catching them in their arms. We had a lady break a burr tip off in her hip. And so the, the treatment there is education and awareness of the employees and connecting with them so they understand that. But Dennis, Dennis Secure, the work we do there is the insurance piece. But we're also, because of the risk management training I've had, and we've developed a whole program around keeping you from needing your insurance and that's the difference and that's where when we deal with malpractice cases or state board challenges the connection is uh, usually sometimes the patients are hurt right that's a definitely a thing patients do get hurt but then the other causality is general patient dissatisfaction like you've missed an expectation and you go back and look at how did that patient have that ex missed expectation and it comes down to how they were treated and sometimes the employees just didn't know how to treat the situation. They weren't prepared correctly. Yeah, and, and I read a lot of research on this um, um, on this malpractice. The, the first thing the uh, malpractice people figured out long, you know, because when the world went from paper charts and paper, all the lawyers had books and carrying stuff, and now it's all digital, so you, so you got big data that they're mining. It turns out that a very small percentage of the doctors keep getting sued over and over and over. And the first thing they correlate to is toxic personalities. And um, so um, the, the, you're not communicating with this person. And uh, so they feel helpless. So what's next? Call a lawyer, call the state board. And, um, you know, just, um, and I see it on Dentaltown all the time. People say, oh, I just got this, this, this letter. They post a letter, they tell it about it. Should I call, should I call my malpractice first? Or should I call her? Hey, why don't you call the person who's upset? Isn't that the shortest distance between two points? Yeah. I would call those people and, and, and um, I mean, you know, you do a denture. She's all upset. She wishes she had her money back and never did it. Okay, I'll give your money back. And then she's crazy because she wants her money back and she wants to keep the denture. But you're like, my God, this is 1987. I don't want you living five blocks away from me, hating me till you drop dead. It's just uh, it's just or, a cost of doing business, or, or worse yet, walk out the door with an unanswered complaint and yeah. uh, posting it on the internet now, which is ubiquitous, and you're now having to, you can't really respond when they post things on the internet, right? So for Yelp or whatever social media platform, doctors are really challenged with being able to respond, and you want to respond, you know the facts aren't all known or posted as the as the patient presents, but you can't respond because but, of but you, other situations. But, but you already know that because yeah. your mama told you when you were little, don't stir shit, makes it stink, just it's done. You know, I, 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 I have two really bad reviews of someone that's never been in our office. I, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't care. Um, and also a lot of people say that if all your reviews are five star, that they're, you know, humans are very cynical and, and uh, so... Yeah, it's uh, easier. It's you're more motivated to post a negative review than you are a positive review. It takes more energy actually to post a positive review, 
because you're not motivated in that way. You know, people, I think uh, uh, psychology is humans are oriented as to be social animals and to warn each other away from danger. And it's just, that's in our nature. It's, and so people, like on almost everything, it's easier to get someone to read an email that's in a negative light than it is in a positive light. Well, you know, I always had a problem whenever they call it social animal because, you know, Newton says for every force, there's an equal and opposite force. Yeah, we're social animals, but look, they all know they need each other to survive. Yes. But look how they live. I mean, I just reading this this morning, 76% of Americans drive alone to work every day, only 9% carpool. Um, they, uh, social security, they all want more money, but all those grandmas live alone. It's like, well, you cut your costs in half. Why don't you move in with the widow next door? They, so they, they're a social animal, but they really like to be, I mean, most people are alone in their car, only a couple of people in the house, anywhere from, you know, a third, like one, a couple, you know, 2.4, whatever. So they, they, um, they're a social animal, but they like their safety that some you know, space they, yeah, yeah they, they like their space well, and their spaces walls lock doors they get in their car they roll up the window they lock their car when they leave so they're social animals who um they need you but they're afraid of you yeah there, there, there's a lot of fear there so um i love that risk is infinite benefits are finite um satisfaction equals expect um, what, what, um satisfaction equals um your experience minus what you expected. And um, we see that in dentistry all the time. Like, like you'll break a burr off in a, um, or you'll break a file in endo. And the only reason it became a nightmare is because you just didn't tell them. I mean, that, that patient knows their car breaks down. They know their transmission fell out. They, they know all, everything humans ever made breaks down, but they just don't communicate. And that, that's the key. That's the key point there is the, the patient. If you're, if you're working with patients and you're thinking about, okay, my rep, every, all these people that are conducting this, what we call a team task, right? All these people individually are contributing to this team task. What is our optimum output for the patient? What is the patient ultimately going to get? And then we say, hopefully positive treatment outcomes and no pain and all this. But, but in, in dentistry, I've seen as dental entrepreneurs, we don't really upfront tell them what to expect from us, from, from the process. And, and, maybe practices do because I don't, I don't know all of them yet. But the one thing is when you look at board reviews or board cases, you sit through those, those conversations or you look at malpractice cases, you, or even look at Yelp reviews, look at one star Yelp reviews as an exercise. And you can clearly see an undertone of the patient's expectations weren't managed up front as to what they could expect. The other thing you have to, that, and this is called an informed consent, right? You, you want to lead the patient down a professional pathway that says, this is what we professionally say is what we expect the outcome to be. And then most state boards, if not all, hold the doctor accountable to present the negative outcomes as well. And this is a, uh, this, the, and if, if we're not presenting the negative outcomes with the treatment plan and the negative outcome occurs, it'd be, it's like you said, it's an unknown that's now unfathomable and we end up with financial situation. And when, when we talk about risk in general, it always ends up coming out of the doctor's pocket in terms of fi uh, either value of the practice or actual money. So when we talk about uh, building a practice, all you have in your business is trust and this relationship with your patients. And if you lose patients because you've lost trust, you end up losing value you know, that's what the practice's uh, valuation is built on is revenue. And a component of revenue isn't, is repeat business. It's not just a singular visit that the patient comes in. There's no value in that. There's revenue there. But having, explaining these things to the patient up front, pros and cons, and letting them walk out with an expectation of, okay, if it does go wrong, it was known, and I'm not going to be upset or as upset potentially if, uh, if had I just been caught out of the blue. You know, um, the old saying is so true. Money is the answer. What's the question? Uh, and, and so when we, you know this, because you know it in other areas of your life, but you don't apply it to dentistry. Like in, in a court, they don't want you leading the witness. Well, you're always leading the witness. Well, you're missing that tooth there. I think we should, uh, we could do an implant there, put on a crown, and you start explaining all this. Next thing you know, you talk them into some, you know, $2,500 treatment. Then something goes south. And then when the lawyers and the boards look at this, the, the first thing they say is, well, well, what was the problem with that missing tooth? Could you not eat, sleep? What was the problem? I had no problems. And then, and then the other 
mama thing is that you know you you think all your patients are victims i mean they i mean the first 108 billion humans that um they think pretty much all the humans lived in our modern form in the last 50,000 years the first 108 billion humans didn't have dentistry and when they come in with a toothache i don't leave the witness well you know um the easiest thing to do in the lowest cost is just pull the tooth and i mean by age 64 10 percent of americans don't have one tooth so i'm sure you're going to live without one tooth and by 74, 20% of Americans don't have one tooth. So the easiest, fastest, quickest things to do is let's just pull the tooth. Because what does that do? Now, instead of them coming, I'm a victim, will my employer pay for it? Is there a government program? It's like, let's just pull it. Let's just pull it. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, I don't want to pull the tooth. I, I want to keep it. So now they're buying into this. that They want to save their tooth. Well, that's a luxury item. Yep. I'm sure there's, um for... There's 8 billion people on the planet, and if we reduce that to three, one has a cell phone on the internet that Steve Jobs started in 2007. One third just has a cell phone, and one third ain't got anything. So you're not entitled to a root canal buildup and crown, and, and, and you're not a victim and all this stuff like that. So how you handle people, your employees, your patients, their satisfaction equals the perception. What's happening? Minus what I expected. Well, I expected just to not take care of my teeth, live off Dr. Pepper and Cheetos. And then when I need a root canal that obviously the president or the, my employer should pay for it. And you're just like, you're, you're a scientist. Okay. You got a toothache, you know, the cheapest fat, the fastest, easiest, cheapest, best thing to do. Let's just pull the tooth. Yeah. And then they change their card game. Well, I don't want that because I know that health is wealth and I want to, I want a luxury item. And then the second thing they do wrong is when I tell you need a root canal, but you go to McDonald's and order a hamburger. What's the next process? The 16 year old kid demands the money payment in full. And then she hands you the hamburger. Then these guys, you know, they, they sell you this big dentistry, then they do it. And then the patient doesn't pay. Now they're incentivized to not pay by going to the board or an attorney. So it's just, um, I, I always tell everyone that, you know, um, life is so much easier if you understand people. I mean, I'd rather you get an A in people and a C or a D in time and money yeah. than get an A in time and money and get a D in people. Well, here's, here's uh, I got a statistic that'll back up that commentary is that 80% of all malpractice cases, at least according to one of our insurance companies that looked at 5,000 cases, 80% of them yielded zero payment to the, the plaintiff, the patient. So then they dug into why, what, what was happening in those 80%. And a lot, much of it was a dispute over money or patient dissatisfaction. So there's, that's the causality of it. So uh, because we're in Phoenix, and I told you when, before we were sitting down, I worked at Motorola. And one of the big thing, trainings at, at Motorola, when you're, when you're making anything in a repetitive nature, you uh, have a process and to measure that process, you use some sort of methodology and Motorola adopted this thing called Six Sigma, which was from the Japanese Kaizen approach of, of, of manufacturing. And uh, Six Sigma popped out and it was basically from, for a layman's perspective, uh, every time you do something, there's a chance for an error. And the way to affect that error, improve your outcomes is to statistically manage your process more closely so the outcome is good. So that every time you hand the baton, you're not latently building up risk through the process. And so how do you apply that to dentistry, right? A service business, a medical business with, uh, when you're not dealing with chips, you're dealing with people. And it comes down to process and that's why we built Dundesk. And the, the reason why we started that software company was in my offices, I was in 200, uh, in, walked into 200 offices, working with them. And I just kept seeing the same thing over and over that the, the practices lacked systemic process that would yield success. They were accident, in a lot of cases, they were accidentally having success, meaning they were avoiding failure just because the failure hadn't come yet. And uh, I'm a big believer in putting process in play. So when a patient comes in, you're going to have this experience and they're going to be able to understand how you practice dentistry and your people are also going to understand how you want them to practice dentistry. Um, an example of that would be, I like to ask my practices, how drunk is too drunk? 
when a patient comes in, how drunk Wait, is too I'm drunk? an Irishman. That's, that's <laughs> the one question I should be able to just nail. Uh, but anyway, I'll... Well, the other, the other one, uh, make, it, make it a little less, uh, uh, make it easier, is how young is too young? You know, there's a habit of patients drop, parents dropping kids off for treatment in the practice. And, uh, you know, do, does the practice have a stance on how young is too young? And, and if not, what risks are you accepting by allowing minors to be in your practice? Uh, what could be alleged? And what do we do if we have an emergency event? Um, also, with respect to process, are we trained and prepared and ready to handle emergency events? Or are we just going to wing it and go down the process? So that's what Dundesk is designed to do is to help the doctor manage these things in various ways uh, in a singular way online it's an online platform but uh, it allows the doctor to build their compliance program and process programs so so anyway your video stop struggling to manage your dental business dundesk is the dentistry practice management software that provides a suite of resources that automate the admin operations to your dental practice um, risk management dental compliance better hr practices um so um so let's, um, and, and I like that design because uh, the easiest thing to understand it is with money because it's so easy to count. It's the, uh, you know, I like money and drugs because those are the only ones that use metric. Yeah. Uh, the only Americans that know what a kilo is are dealing uh, huge volumes of drugs. Um, but um, with, um, you know, you look at account receivables and they're always working their account receivables for, for 40 years they have an account receivable from. It's like, you could just change the process and this be done. I want filling. Give me two hundred. We give filling. You know. Yeah. Uh, so, so you're saying Six Sigma is looking at the processes that keep having reoccurring problems and change the process instead of dealing with the outcome. Yeah, and or yeah, know what your outcome want, needs to be. What your ideal outcome is. I mean, if you're a dentist driving to work, or if you're a dental student going to school right now, um, you know, you're you're kind of sometimes going to show up, and you don't know how your day is going to end, and that's partly because you didn't may have not this uh, let me see you may have not determined what that individual delivery process for your patients look like what the quality is how you wanted your your people to interface with those patients and what the patient should feel and believe when they leave and and to have that level of sophistication in the practice requires you to identify what that is and then also train your people and develop your process so it's is repeatable that's the other thing with, with Six Sigma is you should be able to take a process, pull it out of where it came from, stick it in someplace else, and with the same level of discipline, get the same result. And this is really important for, for that because we would test product in Austin, develop the product and the testing process as we're manufacturing things. Then they would bubble wrap that whole thing and ship it over to Indonesia and plug it in and off it would go all the bugs would be worked out in one place and they would develop all that process and push it out. That's the theory behind Dundesk and the actual practicality of it is as a dentist, you can develop your process, train your people on it with nothing more than a phone. You can record it, load your phone video up into the system, assign it to everybody and make sure they've read it and actually even retest people. Uh, it'll, the, some of the trainings can expire during the year. So people have to retrain. So things like setting up trays or, how do we do our front desk phone calls? How do we greet people? How do we build? Like all these processes you can upload into Dundesk. And, um, and it's funny because you work for Motorola mm -hmm. and, um, and I've lived out here. So I lived through the whole deal where I had patients coming in that worked for, that were engineers for Motorola. And they were very, very frustrated because they, they, they were talking about, you know, I mean, um, humans looked at silent movies while having a phonograph for 40 years before it dawned on anybody to put the peanut butter on the chocolate and it'll be better. And the, um, what Steve jobs did of just taking, I mean, it was a peanut butter chocolate. So just, let's just add the internet to the phone. And I remember when I got here, the whole phone industry was half Motorola and half Nokia. Yeah. Nokia. Yeah. Nokia. And they're, they're dead. And right now you see all these dentists having a lot of emotional problems with the changes, but um, you, you just got to get on top of it. So six Sigma, um, describes, um, the term six Sigma is used as it describes a target of 3.4 defects per million opportunities, which is considered to be world-class Sigma is a term given to a measure of deviation in a data set. And so the other, so how that applies to healthcare in my mind is that, um, 300,000 Americans die each year from an iatrogenic hospital issue. 
They didn't have a problem. They went to the hospital and 300,000 died. And you go to the hospitals in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and the, the surgeon pulls up in his Porsche. She's wearing Nikes. He walks across the parking lot, goes in the elevator, and he religiously washes his hands for 10 minutes like it's some weird thing, and then fillets you open, and then there's all this infection. Then you drive across the street to Motorola or Intel, which is very hard to get in. You got to have a patient for security and all that. Someone's got to let you in there. And you walk in, you take off all your clothes, you shower, you redress, you have a mask on, you breathe the air, the air is filtered at one part per billion because if one little dander for hair or something fell on yeah, that cla chip. Class 10 clean room. Yeah. yeah, a class 10 clean room. So America, it's so embarrassing that we have a class 10 clean room for my iPhone and then your mom is going to go into the hospital and be one of those 300,000 that dies. So well, she, she almost did. My, my stepmother went in for a broken hip and she came out six months later after surviving a staph infection in the hospital. Yeah. And, and um, that took years of her life off. And so hospital contracted infections is a major financial problem. And this is why when you go to a hospital, you'll see gel bottles every six feet on the wall, foam bottles, antiseptic foam. Going yeah, yeah but, it, but if you took the nicest hospital anywhere found on the world, would it pass Motorola for a chip room? Well, it's a different level. It's a different standard. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's a different standard. But I'd, I, I'd like to be the higher standard than the iPhone. Well, that's, you wish, right? <laughs> so like, okay, so OSHA, let's say this. OSHA says you cannot take personal protective equipment out of an operatory that's been used in a procedure, right? But yet, every day, dental employees are taking home lab coats that were used in procedures to wash at their house, right, against the law. And it's just a training. It's a training. It's an ignorance thing, right? People just don't know the law, so therefore they just react. And so you legally can't wear your scrubs home? If it, well, if it's the out, outer layer that's presented to the patient as you're working, then that cannot go home. That cannot leave the operatory field. Wow. And... um um. And it has to be long sleeve. Well, yeah, you can't have uh, underlying clothing or, or skin visible or not visible, but available. You know how embarrassingly contact. old I am? When I opened up my practice for the first five years, we all wore shorts because it's the desert. It's 118 degrees outside. And the hygienist used to always say, the assistants, you know what I love most about wearing here? It's fun. And we get to wear shorts. And then OSHA came along and said, no. And they were very upset. Well, you know, the, the, it, this really hit home when my daughter was diagnosed with tuberculosis when she was two. And the infectious disease doctor, while we were getting tested ourselves to see if we were infectious, said that if, if we are determined to be infectious, we would have to notify everyone we've previously come into contact with in the last day or so to have them tested as well. And I tell that story in front of dental practices, and, and occasionally I'll have employees say, you know what, I've received that letter from my primary care physician that they recommend we be tested because a patient came in the day we were there with and was diagnosed with tuberculosis. So that is not something you want on your letterhead as a, as a practicing <laughs> dentist, right? Like, hey, I receive, you know, I hand out letters of potential infection to my <laughs> to my patients, right? And and all of this, the reason why my stepmother got sick plainly is somebody just did not do their job somehow. Staphylococcus bacteria made it from someone else to her through a contact situation. That but, but come on, I'm going to be hard on you. Um, this is Dentistry Uncensored. Um, the research is now um, showing that that's apps actually not true. When they go in there, because these as these cases got real big, they started saying, come on, we do 23andMe. She had this infection. Let's go find where it came from. Yeah. And it turns out there's 10 trillion organisms living in your gut and watch watch grandpa on the couch he's sticking his finger in his ear he's rubbing his eyes he's going to the bathroom and the and the ones uh, I, I read a paper the other day were like four were like tracked down like a crime scene and all four staff all four infections came from her own gut microbiome mm. so you're she's laying in bed and you're cleaning the counters and autoclave and everything while she's scratching her nose and grandpa's scratching his rear end and 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 in fact you look at that and you're like okay if you got an open wound and they're a human that's scratching themselves maybe it's time to put mittens on them and uh but anyway so i i think that i think that model or that um that is is going to turn out true because the hospital is scratching their heads yeah it could it they could do be all this stuff and she still got it 
There, and, there was a uh, there was a research report, and I'll have to pull it up from my studies that they looked at ninety eight hospitals, and uh, I can't exact uh, recall the exact study. I, I can get it for you, but it's they looked at the hospitals and they studied uh, students, medical students that were there, and they said the medical students on average touched their face something like a hundred times a day, and they also noted that the uh, medical staff there only washed their hands effectively fifty percent of the time. And th- which just points to the, the, the illustration of that research report was that if, if hospital contracted infectious diseases are a big problem, then the process, something in your process is causing this. And you have to identify what those processes are. And that's what risk management is, is identifying what the potential causes of risk are and managing them, managing them, managing them willfully uh, and, and uh, w- with a certain amount of consciousness. <laughs> So, so, um, so if you go to Dundas.com, mm-hmm. it's three things. It's risk management, dental compliance, better HR. So risk management, Dundas helps you manage your business with expert resources that manage risk. Yes, sir. And how, and, and summarize that for the best example. For uh, well, for the HR piece, uh, the question. Oh, I'm, no, I just on the risk management. Oh, piece. for the risk so management three. piece. So it, one, you can develop your own training courses that reflect how you want to run your business and effectively train your people in a repeatable way. So they're not left to do what um, I tell my doctors, don't let your employees run your business, meaning give them clear instruction sets on how you want them to operate. So they're not winging it or bringing in training that they have had previously. Okay. Now you're lecturing them are at the Houston Dental Society? Or, or? It's, uh, it's, it's for a, a dental supply company there. And Midwest it's just Dental? Midwest Dental, yes, sir. And what, what, are you, um, what are you talking about tomorrow? So I'm doing a, a – there's a three-hour set. So the first hour is OSHA, the second hour is HIPAA, and the third hour is emergency preparedness. OSHA, HIPAA, mm-hmm. and uh, emergency preparedness. Yes, now, sir. Um, are those all uh, – so Dundas, three things, risk management – Dental compliance, better HR practices. Would you say those are all with uh, covered on Dundas? Yes, those classes are in there. Yes, sir. So pre- an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So you're saying that um, a big lion's share, what you're observing in your 15 years, is us uh, um, that you need to prevent more risk by better staff training on on three main subjects of OSHA, HIPAA, and emergency preparedness. Well, I, uh, that's not all Dundas does. I mean, there's you do, uh, the bigger risk. Like for example, New York. State New York City launched a requirement for employers to provide sexual harassment training. The city and the state have two different. I rules. actually signed a waiver and gave it all to my staff. Go for it. Just, <laughs> uh, it's, it's cool. Uh, so so that's in Dundesk. So we we picked up the laws, called the attorney general, studied what they wanted us to teach doctors, and we put that in there. Did a class and 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 put that in. in now you've got 15 years. Have you seen sexual harassment claims an issue in dentistry? I mean, and the, like the top 10 things that you're seeing, is that a highly weighted issue? Uh, it can be in a situation where uh, it has been. Yes. I mean, you're in close proximity, you spend a lot of time and things could be said or done. Or if you go to an offsite event, even though you're not in the work, you're still at work. And those, those allegations have been made. I wouldn't say it's I, I, I don't have a ranking of top 10. I think the number one issue doctors do face are employment related issues. I mean, that's certainly within the top one or two day to day. If you talk about entrepreneurial satisfaction with the job, the, if you say, Hey doc, what satisfies you about entrepreneurship? Uh, the number one reason is not <laughs> employees. It's uh, the something else. The employment related issues seem to be the number one phone call I received just because of my HR background, doctors, uh, tap into that, and uh, it, and it, oftentimes the answer comes down to, well, why isn't that in your handbook? Well, what's a handbook? You know, why is it? Why wasn't process or expectations established? Just like we let in so with you say, employment related issues is the main risk. I would say for an entrepreneur, yes. And how would you succinctly say that employment related issues are the main? I think a the top one of the top risks for dental entrepreneurs is employment practices liabilities the liabilities associated with employing people. And that could be things like discrimination or sexual harassment, failure to promote, uh, breach of contract, if you have some sort of contract. Okay, so sex, uh, promotion. Discrimination. Discrimination. And is that ba- and what is that usually based on? Uh, well, your race. Race. Uh, race or, or any, some other characteristic that um, has been mar- you know, perceived to be marginalized within the practice. 
So um, sexual, um, what, what do they call it? Sexual harassment? Sexual harassment, yep. Uh, failure to promote is another one. Or failure to promote. Failure to promote. And that would be um, if, if you've made a, a promise of promotion or you've made some sort of agreement that if you did these things, we would move you, and then you did those things. And um, Okay, let's just, um, the, uh, I um, loved my, my, my go-to thing uh, during college, you know, when you couldn't study any more physics or math was autobiographies. I don't like biographies. I don't really care what you yeah. think of that guy. Um, I want to read what he thought. And um, um, so many of them had this ironclad rules of sex harassment. Like, um, if you wanted to go to lunch with me, I mean, I got 50 employees. We're not going alone. Yeah, Billy Graham. We're, we're not going alone. Yeah. So if you're not going to go alone with me somewhere. If we go to a convention, I stay on a different floor. Mm -hmm. If we have to meet, even though you're a guy and we're just doing shots at the bar, you can't meet in my room because if I let you in my room, then it's discrimination against everyone who's a girl. So, um, you know, so, um, and because this, so just, just put down some ironclad rules that you want to do. And everybody's making fun of Mike Pence for that. Maybe he carried a little extreme, but um, probably didn't have any sex harassment claims. So then promotion, um, which position is this usually? Is it the dentist? Um, well, it's just in the definition of, yeah. of employment I mean, who's, practices who's, liability. Who's, who's, um, who's calling a lawyer because they thought they were going to get a promotion and didn't? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think you, that, give, give I mean, that, that, well, I, I, that would be a, just one of the pieces of the definition. Okay. I think one of the ones that the, I'll give you the one that recently popped up was um, I'm having a performance issue with a, a, a protected class, which would be an older woman, let's say, that would be considered a protected class. And uh, the doctor had made promises to her, but, but then the doctor is consolidating his businesses because he's preparing it to sell. He lays her off. And she alleges wrongful termination, which is another piece of employment practices liability. So the doctor then has to defend himself against this wrongful termination. And other allegations were made. Um, so that, discrimination and wrongful termination. Mm -hmm, yeah. And let me uh, let me just say something about minorities really, really quick. <clears throat> this is a much less weighted issue in my mind. What I see the biggest problem with uh, minorities is I, um, I, I go into an office in Phoenix. And you think you just landed in New Delhi. I mean, I, I, I lectured in New Delhi. And they're in an area that's like 100% Hispanic. And it's like, you know, it's the, um, just you, you, your staff should reflect the people. And um, I, I see dental offices that are in an area right here in my backyard all the time. They're like, they're, they're in an area where the five mile radius is 25% speak Spanish as a primary language. No one in the entire office speaks Spanish. And um, so, you know, um, um, when I think of race in business, humans are so complex. Um, my gosh, I, um, I can't tell you just yet. I mean, patients Monday and Tuesday, I mean, half the time, this conversation switched to Spanish. I don't, I don't know what she asked, what's her, I don't, I don't even know what's going on. I'm just doing my molar root canal. But if everybody in there is not um, reflect your customers, I think it's a bad business idea. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a comment on the race aspect, but when I hear that, I hear a communication issue, right? So you're trying to communicate complex, perhaps complex medical terminology or a situation, and you don't speak the language or culturally you're not sensitive to the way people receive medical advice or perhaps someone moves Oh, there, it, it can't be done. Know? It can't be done. Like when I lecture internationally, I know you're not going to believe this, but I... I the humor drops completely because it just doesn't work. You don't realize how complex a pun is. Yeah. And that's not going to be picked up by English as a second language. Yeah. And, and humans are so complex and language and syntax and expression. And, uh, oh, yeah, you just, um, you, you, you want, I, I couldn't even imagine. What, what do they call it? If you only know one, one language, if you know two languages, what do you call I have no idea. Bilingual. Bilingual, okay. If you know okay. one language, what do you call Unilingual? An American. An American. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I mean, I've podcasted so many people that they did this podcast as English as a second language. Yeah. I couldn't imagine. If you told me tomorrow I got to do a podcast and I got to do it in Japanese or Spanish, I mean, I, I don't know how they do it. Well, you can't, you can't indict Americans on that just because we didn't, they didn't have that as a forced curriculum in our school. Uh, that was an elect, usually an elective. I mean, there's certain classes. I got to take Spanish, right? And I used to travel in Mexico and I understand Spanish. 
as far as I can get a bed and a beer, right? I mean, that's about as good a as I am. Beer and a what? bed and a beer. Oh, a bed right? and beer. Yeah. <laughs> so the uh, but but if if they would have forced me as part of mathematics, like the same discipline as mathematics or reading, to have that track, I would speak Spanish be, if it was part of my community. But it's not part of my community. I mean, I live in San Antonio, and it is, but I I don't. Even my neighbors who are from Acapulco next door, they they choose to speak English, and uh, I try to get them to speak Spanish with me, but I'm terrible at it, so they don't they don't do it. They, yeah, I am. Um, we got into this with uh, Dental Town back in 1999 about um, the foreign language, and should we make uh, foreign language websites on that? And, and uh, so I went down to ASU. That's what I was doing. I always try to find who's the smartest guy in this. So I went down to ASU. I went to the language department, and I, and I found one guy that spoke my language, and he basically said, "Look, Howard, there's eight billion people on the planet. If you wake up, you're born, and you got 50 million people to talk to. You're never going to learn another language." So when you go to someone like uh, Brazil's got 200 million people, they speak Portuguese, China, you know, but when you go to like little Denmark and they just got 5 million people, well, they got to communicate with the Germans, the French, the Russians, the English. So those people will know like five languages. So bottom line is, um, use it or lose it. If you don't need it, you're not going to spend a lot of time on it. And in fact, if you don't need something and you're spending a lot of time on it, most people would say you don't have very good time management. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. And, um, but, but I think that the, the, the point, the point that you, that, that we both were trying to drive at is, you know, w within the practice, well, at least the point I would like to make as far as if you think about this is the, the implications of your team being prepared to have these conversations with people that would come in. And that's a, that's a purposeful thing, right? I mean, just driving back to making sure your people understand the situation and how to communicate with them. Uh, it's not every day you meet an Amish person, right? And, and there, that person may come into your practice and you, there's not going to be a routine you've practiced on that particular situation, but you might meet someone who's, let's say, anxious or has anxiety, which is a communication barrier, and have your team be under understand how to handle that situation effectively so it doesn't drive unnecessary problems into your practice preoperatively. Yeah, the Amish, um, amazing. Uh, the Amish have settled in as many as 31 states in Canada and Central America, though about 63% are located in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana. The greatest concentration of Amish is in homes and adjoining counties. Well, I grew, I grew up in Kansas. There's actually a big uh, Amish community there. And the last time I was visiting my mom, I saw the most adorable thing I'd ever seen in my life. You know, there's the buggy going down the street. Dad's up there. There's horses. And the girls are in dresses, and they're so adorable. And she's sitting on the back of that buggy. Looking at her phone. Oh, yes. <laughs> Looking I'm at her phone. Like that. It's, just, it's just like, oh, I'm just like, oh. I mean, well, time's got to change, man, a little bit. Yeah. It's got to um, change. So, um, so w which is bigger than um, an issue, dental malpractice or um, you, you said that the biggest risk is um, um, uh, for entrepreneurs is uh, staff issues. So what's the bigger issue? Is it, um, is it dental malpractice or is it um, staff? Uh, well, if we, had to, if we had to stack the two staff out by, by a large measure, Really? Yes, by a large measure. So the average dentist is going to pay more coin settling staff issues than perform dentistry malpractice. Issues? Uh, ultimately, not in terms of not in terms of maybe policy premiums or outright payments, but in terms of time, that investment and frustration, that's a huge huge component. Um, that's definitely way outside of that. I mean, most doctors, from my experience, will have a serious malpractice case once, maybe twice in their career. Right. That's the average, you know, and it's uh, going to happen. It just, that's why you have car insurance. Like when you wreck your car, when my boys call me and say, you know, I wrecked my car. My first question is, are you okay? Is anybody heard? Do they call an ambulance? Is you know, not money because you have insurance. Yeah. So, um, but in the spectrum of risk, you know, there's financial risk, there's environmental risk, there's people risk, there's malpractice risk, there's governmental regulate regulatory risk. There's all kinds of different categories of risk that you can face. What, what I want to try to help doctors avoid is just accepting all that risk without any sort of contemplation. And one of those ways, so we, we developed Dundask and it's been, it's been great. It's been really good. Everybody loves it and they see it as necessary and useful. But what I've also seen is that you can't out software bad leadership. Like people, people buying Dundesk thinking it's going to solve their problems within their practice. And it does create some efficiencies. It does create a lot of efficiencies, but 
the underlying issue of why all these inefficiencies exist is the lack of leadership skills on, by, on the part of the dentist or the dental owner. The other, th other thing is you have DSOs, these big DSO meetings and these group meetings going on, and you look at all the agendas, the ADSO and is, the, is one of the you know, guys, there's a bunch of them out there. Nobody's talking about risk management. Everyone's talking about the upside, not the downside or the potential downsides. And I think that's a disservice. And I think it's opening up these guys and gals who want to do group practices or multi locations uh, to unnecessary risk in the end. They're not made, being made aware up front. And um, the, the other, th um, you know, the some people just get a lot of satisfaction out of saving money. And some people just, they never have their eye on cost. And they, they, their whole life, they need more raises and they want more returns from Charles yeah. Schwab. I mean, it's like, you got a spending problem. Like, like they'll, they, they want to learn something on occlusion. So they get in an airplane, fly here to Phoenix, Seattle, whatever, drop $3,000 plane ticket. And then when I get back home, I said, well, okay, um, tell me exactly what you didn't know before you left that you know now. And then I'm like, um, my God, I mean, these online courses, how much is an online course on Dundesk? Oh, well, it's in free. It's included in the fee, in, in the okay. monthly fee. If you bought it a la carte. Well, what's the monthly fee? Uh, well, it depends on the size of the practice. Most practices are 149 bucks a month. For Dundesk. For Dundesk. So Ridiculously most, cheap. Most practices. Uh, so Dundesk costs uh, $149 a month. Is that a contract? No. Month to month. Month to month. Mm -hmm. That's a huge red flag. I mean, could you imagine um, you're moving into college and you meet your dorm room and he makes you sign a contract? that you have to be my roommate all year. I kicked my first roommate out, I think like the third day. Um, so um, so you don't have a contract, that's great. So $149 a month, what, what if it's um, a DSO or a large group? Yeah, we usually price that based on the location. Uh, so it negotiated as we go. Uh, yeah. The last several ones we did was around 75 bucks a location. So it's still r ridiculously cheap. For, for those guys, the... Uh, and how long has Dundust been out? Well, we launched it last year. We had 100 offices sign on last year as our closed beta, learned a bunch of stuff. It's cool when you develop software, you get to see how people use it. And then we spent the spring this year uh, implementing a, a new functionality that our doctors wanted. And what was that functionality? Uh, so they wanted internal chat. So we have a chat feature now within the software. They wanted the ability to have a resource library. So we built a resource library. We have almost uh, 300 practice management documents we've created. Everything from emergency preparedness, infection control, operations, HR. We even have an employment handbook template. We worked with a law firm. We put in there as a resource library. But then the doctors wanted a place to store their own stuff as well. So we created a, a library where they can put their own uh, standard operating procedures and other marketing documents, patient facing documents in the system. So they have a singular place to keep all this operational activity. Nice. So how's year two going? It's um, very good. I'm tired of driving. Uh, I've driven a lot of miles. Yeah, I'm on the road a lot. And I think it's important to not phone it in a lot of service, a lot of software companies try to do this virtually. And, and I think it's really important to know the day-to-day -day experience of the doctors. I mean, that's the real key thing is let the doctor pull me into the room off to the side and go, Hey, this is what's going on. <laughs> and then I can diagnose, how can we help? What, what is the solution? And is this solution applicable to a lot of practices? That's been good. That's been the hardest part is just being away. Uh, but it's also been the, the, the best part of it. This, this is why I started podcasting. Um, August 4th, 1990, I gave my first lecture at the Sheridan in Manhattan. So this August 4th, 2020, will be 30 years of this. And I just love right now yeah. when you get an email from, uh, like, like when I get an email from India, I'm like, dude, you realize that to go talk to you, I used to have to fly five hours from Phoenix to New York, 15 hours to New Delhi, which is exactly on the other side of um, uh, Phoenix. So, you know, 12 noon here is 12 midnight there talk to 200 people for a day and then turn around 15 hours back. I mean, I lived like a cockroach and now I'm sitting here, you know, so uh, digital, it, it's scalable. Yeah. So all the work you put into one, move the decimal place over to 10, not much more work. You just learn more. So it, it, it's amazing. I, you, you did, you did touch on something about cost, right? And so you said some doctors are cost, super cost conscious and some are have spending problems. 
And we have something in the middle, you know, the old adage, stepping over dollars to pick up dimes. And what I do when people ask me, how much does this stuff cost that you do and whatever it is, whatever program we have, I always tell them, well, the cost of inaction, first of all, know the cost of inaction. If you have a penalty or a fine, here's what that number is, right? I'm not fear mongering, but I just want you to put that into balance, right? So informed consent is really what we're driving for. And so I think that's with, with your patients, you want to tell the, you want to make sure in an informed rejection conversation, we're presenting treatment here. And if you choose not to do this, here are the negative outcomes. And here are some of those costs associated with the negative outcomes a bone loss and you know, whatever, uh, whatever you guys put on the list. So for that $149 a month, you got an employee handbook. Yeah. Comes with it. Okay. And then, um, the next is new talent acquisition. There's some issues in, uh, in HR hiring people, access candidate screening templates, yep. interview guidelines, other essential tools. Any, uh, summaries of that? Well, one thing it does, uh, our software does that uh, nobody else has is it's a checklist of all the documents you need to get from your employees. And so the employees get an account and they can log in and load in all the documents that you need to collect from them on an initial basis and an ongoing basis. So their CPR cards, licensing, you know, if it's a bunch of independent contra or associate dentists, you know, they have their DEA licenses, if they have their own individual malpractice policies and you can put time dates on all those documents. And every Friday for the first time in dentistry, every Friday, the employees receive an email that says, these are all the documents that are expiring this is what you owe us. And here are all the training courses you need to take to be in compliance with our practice. So it's amazing. So all this regulation, which, you know, everybody always talks about taxes, but government regulation is, is more drowning than taxes. And, and um, so um, the, the DSOs, they have departments for this. Like I feel lucky. I mean, with 50 people, I got five people in management. Uh, it's kind of like when you own a McDonald's franchise, there's a McDonald's franchise that never makes a hamburger. They're just working on your processes. And with DSOs, I'm in ground zero for DSOs. 18% um, of the dentists in Arizona are affiliated with the DSO. That's number one. Yep. And that peters all the way out to none. So these DSOs, this is easy for them to do because they got an, a layer of management. So if you're going to save independent dentistry, you, you're going to have to, uh, you, you're wearing too many hats. So you're trying to digitally condense their hats faster, easier, better. I, I asked a lady who Aaron Phoenix, oddly enough, uh, she I said, Tell there's me. no ladies in Phoenix. I, well, I she, Aaron, she, <laughs> Kyle, have you seen one? She was a lady. And, and I said, uh, give me the list of the top 10 things you do day to day as the operations manager. Dundas did seven of them. And so I emailed the doctor and I said, uh, you know, I'm, this can be, all of this can be consolidated into the system. And she said, well, that'll drive her out of my business. I won't need her anymore. And I said, no, what it does is allow her to take what she knows and focus that time on bigger issues. Not where is the CPR card for Jenny at location two? Like that, that's not where you want to be spending your dollars from a person perspective. And that's where the DSOs and these group practices allege they can save you some time. And I say allege because from my experience, um, it doesn't. It uh, I heard it takes thirty thousand bucks to start a DSO, right? And there's there's no barrier to entry as far as the ability to manage business effectively. I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm not saying they're all good. I'm just saying there's effectiveness levels in 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 all of them. And uh, dentists are biting on that. I think they're biting on that promise that all this will be handled. All this administrative stuff will be handled for you, but you still have to give up a piece of your business or your future for us to get that. And I think Dundas sits in that spot where you don't have to do that. It helps that practice get some of this discipline. And when these kids come out of school, how long you're talking about onboarding an employee. I'm always, um, last Saturday was my third September 21st. It was my 32 year anniversary. And I made a post on, I, uh, I graduated May 11 took me 133 days to open. And then I, I got it open September 21, 1987. And 28 days later was black Monday, largest single day stock drop. Um, how congratulations long, how long is the but i see this onboarding they, they come out of school you know the, the the type of person that goes eight years of college doesn't want to be your employee and and i mean everybody i talk to this it seems like the office manager is, is ground zero for problems when she starts talking about dentistry and you know is this acceptable or you need to do and and, and they're just sitting there thinking first of all you're not even a dentist why are we having this conversation you know what i mean yeah and um, things like that. But um, how long are you seeing 
in your experience between graduation and they finally are opening up their own practice to be interested in something like Dundas? Well, they're, they're always retroactively interested. I think when you graduate dentistry, you're in a um, deferred risk management mode until something bad happens to you. The, uh, and what I mean by that is I had a call yesterday with a gentleman who got the bank loan, million bucks, bought the practice, moved in, calls me, hey, Carrie, what do I need to know about compliance? Right. He's already spent the money. He's already obligated. And the, 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 and you know, this no dental school has a risk management program or a business program or anything like that. Maybe there's a topical class in year, year three before clinic, you know, that some guy comes in and talks, but it's not part of the program. Just like we talked about our language, right? Language isn't part of our schooling. And if risk management isn't part of dentistry in dental school, people just don't know what it is. And they, inadvertently assume risk and it usually pops out when they start the practice or they buy a practice and they start getting run over by problems they realize wow i don't have the answers here and that's what we want to try to fix and part of that fix is high trust practice uh, partnered with max kerr dr max kerr in austin and we have a training program that's now is that so that's on um that's on um, dundes.com? Well, that's a separate, it's a hightrustpractice.com is that. But, uh, oh, did, you got another website. Yeah, I didn't mean to bleed into that, but. but what, what, what's it called? It's called high, um, hightrustpractice.com. On www. Yep, www.hightrustpractice.com. High mm-hmm. And what this is uh, with uh, Dr. Dr. Kerr's client, and we got to talking about challenges. As a matter of fact, he was probably one of the originators of why Dundesk exists because he, he says, hey, I have all these employees. What are all, what, what does the state require me to have as far as all these documents? And I, that's what started us building Dundesk. And through that relationship, we started having these discussions on leadership and talent and management and marketing. And how do you build a practice that you can trust yourself? And then allow your people to trust it and then allow your patients to trust it. So it's a process that we've developed and uh, we've done something like 16 hours of recording and we have these training courses. Uh, We launched our beta. We have 15 offices in the beta right now. We're in our last, last week of that. A class comes out every week uh, for a serious period of time. And uh, uh, the, uh, we're having a final, our final conclave this weekend to with all of our doctors to talk about what they learned and how it worked and, any innovations they've developed. And who's, who's the other doctor with this? That's Dr. Max Kerr. He's uh, Vista Ridge. M-A-X. M-A-X-K-E-R-R. And he and is. What city is he in? Uh, Vista Ridge. Uh, it's he's in Cedar Park, Texas, right there Vista, outside of Austin. Vista Ridge? Vista Ridge. Okay. And he, uh, it's about a, he does 3 million bucks in production out of a six op practice there. Does pretty good. And he also owns a sleep dentistry business with another dentist. Uh, that does about a million in bucks in production there, and he's he he shares that number all the time. So I'm hopefully and I'm okay why and so Max started this and asked you to join him, or who who started um, High Trust? I started it uh, in terms of the 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 trademark and all that good stuff, websites and all that. But Max Max and I we just started talking about these business problems, and it led into High Trust practice. That's the formulation of it. Oh, I just checked on my email. Uh, email. I recently, that guy sent me an email in 2007. I recently attended your lecture at the Rocky Mountain Dental Convention. I was the red bearded dental student. Um, your talk was entertainment informative, but, um, so he, what was Max trying to um, do? Why, why did Max need this? Was it for his office or he just learned everything the hard way and thought he could scale this to help others or what, what was the, what, what, what drove this innovation? End suffering. End suffering. That's, that's a good one. That's it. Plainly. I, like I said, you can't out software, bad leadership. Uh, you can't out process dissatisfaction with your career. Um, we, you know, they, both of us reached a point in our careers where we were driving to work and dreading what was about to happen to us, mostly because we didn't set our own path of what was going to happen to us. We didn't have the right people. We didn't have the right vision. We didn't have the right process and we didn't have the right help or, co- or um, uh, colleagues or, or fellowship with the right people to help us think straight. We were just buried in our own stuff. And um, I broke out and he broke out and then we got together and we realized that how we did it individually, we brought, we bring different perspectives to the table on how a dentist can achieve success and avoid failure in dentistry. 
and gain a really nice, um, I think, engagement in their career, get their people on board, and make sure the dentist trusts their business. And then, therefore, instead of throwing their hands up and saying, I don't, I don't like going to work, so I'm going to sell out, or I'm going to... What, one, dentist, one dentist told me, I said, hey, man, I have a really good idea to help you get good people. And he said, I'd rather keep my mediocre people than trying to go recruit new ones. And I just thought to myself, that is the crappiest way to live your life. Because there are good people out there, and just because you can't or don't know how to do it is limiting his his amount of satisfaction he has in his career. So we presented this uh, to our dentist, and we had 15 sign up as the beta, and it's been going really good. People really like it. And the format is a podcast similar to this where we just discuss issues, and then you get a side lesson with how to implement this topic. The first lab we developed is Talent Lab, which seems to – we were going to do leadership first, but – we found out, we thought thought about it. It's like, wow, leading terrible people is not a good thing. <laughs> Being a good leader. Leading terrible people. Leading leading a terrible team is not a good thing. And, you know, that's, that's something I'm always aware of where, um, you know, we all got the same brain. There's only one species. All We're the last remaining homo. Yeah. There's no more homo neanderthal, denosovin, habilis, erectus. They're, they're all dead but us. No breeds, one species. And we all got the same brain. And they know the answer in like five different areas, but they don't apply to this one. Like they know in sports, when they're watching their, their team, they're like, well, you need to fire that player and get a better one. It's like, have we met you in person? Yeah, exactly. You know, how do you, how can you backseat drive the Arizona Cardinals without looking at Shirley? Or, or let's recruit the best first baseman and all nod our heads when they sign a $10 million three-year contract, but we want to pay our front desk person $7 an hour and not invest in the first impression of our practice. You know, those sorts of things, right? And uh, and that's the cycle. So we said, let's get the right talent first. Let's chase that dragon first. Let's get that guy out of the room. And then we'll focus on leadership. So our five-part series on on talent labs was developing your vision values. What, what are you about? What are you really about? You get three or five items there. Then how do you a- attract and recruit the right people? Like what's that process? How does it work? How do you do that? How do you onboard them? Which is the really cre- key in getting them productive quickly and into your process. And then how do you performance manage them in a positive way? And then how do you develop them? And developing is key. And this is another thing I see, unfortunately, in the industry is, and you've seen this, I'm sure, is people go to CE classes for no purpose. There's no business reason why you're going to that class other than, hey, it's in Scottsdale. Let's go to play some golf and, or I'm going to send all my people down to the TDA, the Texas Dental Association meeting. And guess what? They're walking around with margaritas and getting their hair blow dried in the, in the um, convention center. And they're not there for a purpose that supports your practice, right? So that's the part about developing and having all that system in place. And oddly enough, people, dentists don't really know how to do that. I'll tell you uh, this. My, my favorite little story is uh, my idol and mentor, Jared Pope. Back in the day, he wanted to learn how to place implants. So every night when he came home from work, first thing he did was just watch, just Google on YouTube dental implants. Yeah. And just watching an hour every night, he figured it all out. But most people are like, oh, no, I... I got to spend $3,000 a weekend and I need to be, um, uh, what, what, what do you call it? Um, why, why are humans always getting, they, they need validated. Yeah. So they got to say, well, I went to Panky or Quays or Spear and I got a trophy and a certificate and a piece of, no, you, you're validating yourself. Can you place an implant on it? Because if you just want to know the information, information has become a commodity. You, 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 they just they deny they, they they overpay for information. That, that's the most succinct way to say it. Dentists pay way too much money for information. But but it's the investment. If the investment is X, right, the return should be Y, the, not Y and like why like why are we here? But the X, the value Y and understanding. If I go do that, my business needs implantology. It needs it to survive, and we're going to do implantology. So I'm going to go take these classes to develop my skill versus ah, I think I'm going to go learn a little bit about implantology and put my toes in there and spend all this money when you could have spent the 3000 bucks, say, on teaching your people some other aspect of dentistry that could lift your business in other ways. But you have to have a plan. Otherwise, you're just going to throw money to the wind and your people aren't going to end up getting well, this we'll, connection. We'll take that and run. I know, I know yeah. we're 10 minutes over, but you flew all the way in on from where? Austin? From San Antonio. From San yeah. Antonio, Southwest Airlines? Yes, sir. Nerdbird. Right. 
My gosh, yeah, Herb Kelleher passed away this year. What a legend. I flew so much. Three times I saw met that guy. Really? What a legend, man. He is so, he was so damn cool. You're talking about not being toxic, and you're talking about HRs. Everyone, he loved him. I mean, he'd just stand there with a cigarette in one hand and a drink in the other, and just just an adorable guy, just a legend. I love that guy. Well, um, so so the brand, the brand values you're contributing to him and to Southwest Airlines, right? That's all by design. Dental offices, dental entrepreneurs don't have that don't have that approach to how they deliver the brand experience within their practice for their patients, right? So and if you're good at it, if you're really good at it, patients refer you by word of mouth. But that's a, that's a key key point we also make in our in our high trust practice is, you know, are your patients walking out wanting to give you word of mouth referrals? And that's the reflection of your brand, just like that was unsolicited as far as feedback around Herb Keller. Yeah, and, and he didn't even design the Southwest Airlines business model. He saw it, he, it was, the whole thing was rolled out in California and it was working great, but then they started expanding international and him and his lawyer drinking buddy thought, what the hell did they do that for? And they went under, here's a lawyer, just saw a business opportunity. They, they weren't pilots. And what I love most about the Herb Kelleher is every time a dental office is on fire, they think that they should just get another validation and take more training, go to more courses and implants, TMJ, all this stuff. Herb Kelleher founded and ran Southwest Airlines his whole life died. He never even got a pilot's license. If any of my homies out there decided they were going to start a, a, a pilot um, business, Oh my God, they'd have to get, they get certified in Boeing. All the hours, hours, yeah. Hours, then they, they would spend their whole life taking pilot classes. It's like Rick Workman. Rick Workman is going to be the first dentist that owns a thousand dental offices and he hasn't seen a patient in 25 years. Rick Workman, uh, Rick Kirshner owns three, you know, has 300 come for dentals. He hasn't seen a patient in 25 years. So they, they peanut butter and jelly the dentistry and the business. And they're, I mean, Ray Kroc is dead and 40,000 McDonald's open this morning and it wasn't cooked by a ghost. Yeah. Uh, so, so business. But um, was it food? That's the thing. That's the It quick. was food. You know what? Back in the day <laughs> when I was little, my gosh, it was the biggest treat in the world. When oh, your yeah? mom and dad would take you to McDonald's and buy a sack of hamburgers. Um, I don't think anybody designed, when they designed Dr. Pepper, they never thought that you'd wake up and drink 64 ounces of it on the way to work. So, you know, um, so there's a little responsibility for that. Um, but, um, so, um, what, what are you, what are you most passionate about on this, um, on this, um, done desk right now? I really, it's for multi-office locations for people that have multi-offices, they can consolidate the, uh, the operational routines that are just in notebooks and folders laying around. And that's been the really big lift the practices that have, we have a seven to seven dental in, uh, San Antonio. It's a friend of mine, Justin Coke, five locations, shout out, Justin, uh, he, D bought uh, they use Dundesk uh, to a great degree and if sometimes if you don't take the training they've built in Dundesk you don't get a paycheck like you don't get hours and that's just a discipline that that I think is really cool about the software and it's working as intended that's why we built it and um I you you flew all the way from San Antonio I don't want to cut you off too rapidly even though Kyle's probably just going to pull the plug on me any second now um but um what would since since the majority of our viewer a quarter of the viewers are still in school and, yep. and the rest are all under 30 and i know and th thanks for um i do read all the comments in the youtube section i know uh um with two bald guys if you're listening to this on itunes it's it's you just got to go to youtube right now um what, what advice would you give to those kids that are, that are coming out of school oh well it's yeah it's the stuff we're doing right now get advice on understanding like creating a risk management mindset. I, I, it sounds boring to a dental student. Like, why do I need to study this stuff? And I'm not saying get into the details like I did with this certification that I, I launched into. I'm saying just go into it with eyes wide open that there is what you're about to do is fabulously amazing. You're an entrepreneur and I come from a long line of entrepreneurs. You'll be able to rely on yourself to earn a living. And that is absolutely the most beautiful thing in the world to me and to my family. But don't expect that it's going to be easy and it's with it's without challenge and risk and shore your skill, your technical skills up as much as you shore up your entrepreneurial skills. Those two things go together and they cannot be separated in the future. Lest you just want to be an, a, an employee dentist and fall into uh, you know an employee employer relationship model where you don't have to worry about all this stuff. 
Are and you seeing that though? What, what percent of the market is that? I mean, um, how many of those 6,000 graduates a year in the United States now, when they come out, that's just what they want. They, they just want a real a good high paying job. They do not want to be an entrepreneur. Well, you know, when debt's motivating you, uh, you know, you have to pay down the debt. And I think that's the sell for, for the group practices, corporate dentistry is, you know, you can come in, we'll help you with your debt by, by a steady income and here's a location. And it's and, great because you got this big debt and they pay you just enough to stay with them just long enough to kill all your dreams. And it looks like it's about five years, so about 20% a year drop ship. So yep. it's about five years. And, um, um, but what, what percent do you think, um, have the mindset that they do not want to be an entrepreneur? Very, oh, uh, not be an entrepreneur just flat out. I would say just anecdotally, like 20%, I think the 80, one, 20. yeah. Well, and the other 80, the 80 goes, well, I'm going to go work corporate and then eventually bounce out. And the few, like maybe 5% will say, I'm coming in buying right out of school. If they're in a residency program, right? I mean, the banks usually don't fund a fresh out of dental school, but if you're in a res AGD residency and you want to come out, they usually get some money there. Um, that that's how I just anecdotally see it. I try to help my, uh, when I work with dental students, I try to connect them with my, my companies, my dentists, cause I know they need help. So we try to make connections and that just seems to be the way it falls out. Yeah. And some of them are perfect. Like I, I got a good friend in the Valley here and she, she works at um, PDF. She works for Steve Thorne. She's single. She's got a kid. She, she's got, she's single with a kid. And that, that's a big commitment. It's a big source of her joy. And then she, you know, had a couple of dogs and she loves the fact that she's in place. She doesn't want to be in place. And it may change. You got to remember when people say, what's a bigger market, um, a steakhouse or McDonald's? Is it Taco Bell or a sit down Mexican restaurant? It's actually both for the same person, depending on your age, yeah. um, where you're at in life. Um, it's, it's like when you're in college, um, all your friends are very different. As soon as you get married, you find out a year later, now all your friends have changed and now they're all married. Then when you start having kids, you no longer hang out with the, the married kids, the people, uh, the smart ones that don't want any kids, uh, that want to be millionaires. Uh, you know, you just, you're constantly evolving. Um, but um, there was a, I did a lecture for the ASDA District 9 ASDA leadership team near off. They had a conclave. Everybody got together from the states and they said, Carrie, after I did my little, my little pitch, they said, Carrie, what would you do if you were coming out as a dentist? And there were probably 40 kids in the room. I call them kids, right? They're all younger than me. And I said, well, if I were you, as you sit in this room, as much as you, if you like them or not, y'all, all all of you get together and form a trust that can help each other build each other's businesses and find funding and grow each other up and group tackle entrepreneurship within this community. That would be how I would do it. And you could go to rural America, rural towns and start this up and uh, rather than pop out on your own and be an individual and then, you know, go through that process on your own, be a group as graduating class of whatever, and then get 10 people together and, and work it that way. That's how I would do it. Say, say it again. I'm, I'm not following. You, you say that your advice to the young kids is to start a, 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 a group of like-minded people. I think if, well, here's the thing with entrepreneurship, in dentistry, you're on an island. And the risk you face is sometimes unbearable to be on an island. So you perceive safety in numbers and you go work for a group practice, right? So you're just transferring risk to the group practice in that regard. I told the students if it were me, because I'm an entrepreneur and I like risk in that way, I said, there's 40 people in this room. You should all group up and form a trust or a corporation where you're all equal partners in it. And there's terms and conditions and what have you. And then group fund, crowdsource, developing and starting practices. That way you can spread the risk out, but you're going to individually benefit within this little community here. And it would just be like a, a crowdfunding situation, but you're spreading the risk out, but you're also helping each other learn as you go. That's how I would set it up. Yeah, but um, but dentists are a little challenging. There is a uh, thread going on in Town today where these people are just dismayed about how, you know, why do dentists bad mouth other dentists so bad. I mean, uh, Ronald Reagan, who won by a landslide, said that the uh, 11th commandment was never trash another Republican. And and um, dentists, they, they come out of school and they saw, you know, a lot of backstabbers. They saw, you know, and they they anchor to that, you know, the, the toxic ones or the weird ones. And uh, so I think a lot of them have a lot of trust issues with their college when they get out of school. And then when you get out of school, you walk across because you want to replace 
your buddies from dental school and your buddy across the street, and then you find out that half of them think in fear and scarcity and are all upset that there's another dentist out here. I, it's like I had dinner um, Saturday with Jack Dilbert, drove up to Jerome, Arizona, 5,000 feet up. It was so cool. I had dinner with Jack. You wouldn't believe how viciously he was attacked trying to open up a dental school because of all these dentists. And I'm like, okay, well, didn't you go to dental school? Did your brother Mark, did he buy that oral surgery deal online with a black belt and a, and a, uh, and a um, Eagle Scout online uh, at eBay? No, he, you went to a dental school. Jack's opening up a dental school like the one you went to. And oh my God, you would have thought that he was trying to be, I mean, it was just crazy. Was it because it was a threatening threatening the establishment? Nobody or wants competition. Yeah, that's so threatening the establishment. everybody says they want competition, but not for them. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of like rights. Um, the, the, the reason government is just not working is because everybody says, oh yeah, freedom of speech, right? you do what you want, except for this one thing. You can't drink beer, or you can smoke pot, but or you can drink beer, but not smoke pot. Yeah. Or you can marry a woman, but not a man, or whatever. Every, when you get 100 people in a room and everybody says, oh, yeah, I'm totally for freedom, except for one thing. Well, after 100 people take away one thing, you have no rights. Yeah. And um, so, so they, they don't like any conversation. We're seeing that with SSD um, Smiles Direct Club. Their response is to go to attorneys who in bed with the government to pass laws to restrain free trade and i'm like all the complaining i see on smiles direct club i'm like you don't see any new innovation did did after the whole smiles direct club did you change one thing in your office because i know orthodontists that are sitting and looking at like wow like i remember when they first started coming out they're like yeah, why, why do I have to see them for every trade deal? Why don't I just give them? And so a lot of my friends now, then when they would have given you one tray, they're giving you three. Yep. And, and instead of changing it once a month, they're telling you to change your... So you're saying that in a, in a planet with 8 billion people, where f about a little over 4% live in America with 320 million, that this big company goes public and all you can do is run to a lawyer and grab your shotgun and try to, really, you didn't learn anything? Because I saw that with the original, and then we'll wrap this up with, um, with the Orthodontic Centers of America. Um, everybody has all these emotional things about Orthodontic Centers of America. And what Lazar, Jasper Lazar just blew my mind open is, why are you having to put a third down and finance the balance of something you haven't incurred any cost in. I mean, and the way he explained it is like, okay, you go get your nails done. Imagine if the lady said, well, we're gonna sell you a two year program. We need one third down and we're gonna finance the rest. Finance the rest for what? Are you gonna prepay your employees, rent, mortgage, equipment, bill, like computer, insurance, malware? You didn't incur any cost. And these orthodontists, I mean, they got, you know, they got bands, brackets, whatever, um, clear aligners. It's like, um, um, and orthodontic centers of America, they just said, look, zero down. 0% financing, $199 a month for 24 months, no contracts. And everybody thought, oh my God, I've always wanted braces. Hey, as you go, swipe the I card at the door, right? Yeah, and I, I don't have $1,500 down for ortho. So what, and, and in economics, they call it an economic barrier to entry. And after the rise and fall of OCA, the only one that made on the New York Stock Exchange, and now I'm a grandpa, and 90% of dentists still want an economic barrier to entry for orthodontics for a cost they're not going to incur. And, and then Smiles Direct Club, it's like they, they, they're either going to go bankrupt. I mean, imagine if American Airlines started matching the, pri the fee schedule of Southwest Airlines. Well, the only secret to lower price is lower cost. So Smiles Direct Club is doing something a lot less money. What's the secret? Well, they... They cherry pick the class ones. They're not interested in class twos and class threes. Um, they, they cherry pick the easy cases and um, they give them trays without seeing them and all this kind of stuff. And, and why don't you be proactive and say, what can I learn from that? Instead of the old monkey thing, go get a lawyer, go to my dental society, start suing everybody, you know, uh, suing your way to success is, is the opposite of competition. Well, you know, that's, yeah, when you just, the Smile Direct Club, I mean, from a malpractice perspective, I just see that thing and I go, you know, I'm in braces now. I was in Invisalign. I was non-compliant. And my, my orthodontist said, okay, man, we're just going to put you in braces because you can't get away from those. And I think that Smile Direct Club thing, from a compliance angle, they probably have their, their patients sign off that if you're not compliant, we're not responsible. I think that'll be the failure, actual failure of the product 
in the end will be people being compliant. Well, so today, as we're speaking, and then I keep saying we're going to wrap this up, wrap this up, wrap this up. Um, where is it? Um, uh, no, not there. Not there. Oh, yeah, here it is. Headline news. The Nashville Post, which is headquarters for Smiles Direct Club, and um, doctors, consumer, filed class action against Smile Direct Club. Downtown-based orthodontic venture went public earlier this month. A group of orthodontists and consumers on Wednesday filed a punitive... They, they spelled it wrong. They said putative. Is that punitive? A putative class action against local medical technology venture Smile Direct Clubs, in which the plaintiffs alleged that the company committed fraud in Midwest consumers. The complaint filed in Nashville Federal Court makes a dual allegations against the maker of direct, you know, you know, um, again, I, I, it's all toxic. It's all negative. It's all this. My, my, my interest is the, the one orthodontist in my town that actually just like, this is interesting. I'm going to learn anything about everything about it. And it, it's got him all motivated and he's changing the way he's doing things. So, so orthodontic centers point. of America is gone, but why you still have an economic barrier of interest and whether smiles right club works or not has nothing to do with, did they innovate something that might work for you? So again, it's, is the, is life is glass half full or is it half empty? Do you just going to go through your whole life thinking in fear and scarcity or do you live your whole life in hope, growth, and abundance? And um, I think uh, as a leader in dentistry, I, I think to be a leader, you don't have to lead these guys to learn how to do dentistry. I mean, they're, they're, they're chefs. They want, they want to cook. They, they spent eight years proving, yeah, I, I want to learn how to cook. You don't have to motivate them to, to, to motivate them to go learn about how to work with their hands and do surgery and get people out of pain. Uh, I, I love it. Uh, but you do have to be a leader in trying to motivate them um, to wear the hats they don't want to hat, uh, don't want to wear. And you have to wear so many hats when you own your own business. And the only ones I see are successful is if the dentist parents own their own business. So if you're lucky enough that your, your mom was a dentist, well, hell you lived through it. So you, you don't even realize how much you've taken in. If your dad is a farmer, if you owned a restaurant, if you, if you're self-employed, you know, all this at birth and don't even know, you know it, but my God, if your mom worked and dad were employees and you came home and watched Netflix and Fortnite and whatever, um, you, and you go open up your dental office. Wow. You have no idea what's going to hit you. So my final advice is you need to walk out of school and dive in that swimming pool the first day, because you're a really smart person. I mean, I mean, most people don't know the difference between geometry and trig. You know, that trig is sine, cosine and tangent. You're a smart person. So when you come out and you start analyzing all the risk, you're smart. So you become risk adverse. You know, when the best time I walked out of school, opened up my office and made four boys in 60 months. Now, if I would have known that I would not sleep for a decade, um, and, and I, if I would have thought about it, I might only have two kids or one kid, um, or, or, you know, so you're, you're when you look at a 0.5% failure rate, you're not going to fail. You're not opening up a restaurant. That's competition. Dennis Reed does not have competition. You have about a half percent failure rate. Um, so, um, and that's usually cause your license taken away because you have a, um, some substance abuse problem, gambling problem. You, you have some problem, which you need to find the doctor that fixes that, fix that, then come back and you're still square one. Just dive in and don't talk about whether or not you should have a kid or not. You should have two or three before you start having those thoughts. How many do you have? Two. Two. So you're twice as smart as I have. Ah. Uh, I'm trying to talk Kyle into just uh, stopping this now before it even gets started. Uh, ah. But, but. Part two, maybe. How old are your kids? <laughs> uh, we got a 13 and a seven. Yeah. So girl. a 13 and seven, you, you, you think you're a genius. You're ready to write a book. Oh, I got two perfect kids. I'm going to write a book on how to um, raise a child. And then they turn 16, they get a pair of car keys and good luck. Yeah. With that, yeah. Buddy. Thank good, you. Good luck with that. <laughs> hey, thanks for helping my homies learn the stuff that they are not attracted to. Um, when you own a restaurant, I've been in Ahwatukee for 32 years and only three restaurants have been there at the same time. And they're the ones who spend more time knowing what a table costs. And you know, you walk in there one day, what happened to the tablecloth? Well, you know, when you realize that every damn table has a dollar and it's a dollar to launder and what, you know, and they just know their numbers, know their numbers, know their numbers. So know your numbers. Um, you know, you don't have to motivate your kid to go do what he wants to play with. Um, to be a leader for your child, you got to sit there and try to uh, sell them on the importance of um, 
of, of why they need to learn this and you can get them all excited about it. And, and I like it when, um, old people are trying to help my young, um, the next generations of dentists that are going to replace us into, okay, you like, you like bleaching bonding veneers, but now let's talk about malpractice and employee handbooks and all the things that you never, that were not part of the decision to become a dentist. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the show and thank you for posting on dental town. And, uh, we'll yeah, thanks, sir. <laughs> As a dentist, you know the drill. A lot goes into running a successful practice. From operations to HR, payroll, admin, training, compliance, and more, we can see why you're literally drowning in admin. What if you could run your practice more efficiently while enhancing the entire experience for your employees and your patients? Introducing Dundesk, the dental software platform that automates your entire practice. Whether you're running one dental practice or many, our state-of-the-art platform simplifies and digitally transforms your operation. So long confusion and missing paperwork. And because it works on multiple devices, you increase employee access and minimize risk. With Dundesk, you can onboard new hires with ease, enforce compliance, save hours a week tracking documents, and easily ensure timekeeping and off-time tracking Spend more time with your patients, not your admin, with Dundesk.